again, we are on the pathway to glory. I certainly hope that you are joining me on the pathway to glory. I want to see the kingdom of God. I not only want to see the kingdom of God, I want to be in the kingdom of God. Do you want to be in the kingdom of God? I certainly hope that you want to, to be in the kingdom of God. As we should know again from my sermon last week, God, he should be the head of our life. We saw it in our Sunday school lesson today that Christ should be the head of our life. We should be following him down the pathway to glory. There are many that love to say that the Lord is the head of their life. But the truth of the matter is that they are actually very far from him. How can you say that he is the head of your life, that you're going down the pathway to glory, but do it far from the Lord? That's the thought that I, that I have to talk about here today. So we read responsibly today from the 13th chapter of John's gospel. We read from the first verse down through the 11th verse. That was again, John, his gospel, not his epistle the 13th chapter of John's gospel, where we read from the first verse down through the 11th verse, where in that scripture, we saw where Jesus, he was taking time to wash the defeat of the disciples. We saw in that passage of scripture that there was one that walked with Jesus, but in actuality, he was very far from him. You see there, if you're looking at it, you can see that there in that second verse where the scripture states and supper being in that the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to do what? To betray him, to betray Jesus. As Paul said in our Sunday school lesson last week, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual host of wickedness, even in heavenly places. I would think that feast of Passover with Jesus be in presence. That was certainly a heavenly place. And there the devil was in Judas Iscariot. We see there, you just looking at it. I want to mention there in the third through the seventh verse where we see that Jesus, he knew that what was about to take place there. And we see that he continued to move forward continue to move forward in faith, teaching the disciples one last lesson where we see that he rose up from supper and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And we see where Peter said, ah, oh, don't, no, 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 don't, don't wash my feet. But Peter, Peter didn't know what he was doing there. And Jesus said to him, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Do you want to have part with Jesus today? Again, we're on the pathway to glory. I certainly hope that you that you want to have part with him on the pathway to glory. All of that, it brings me to my key verses for today. That's going to be the 10th and the 11th verse. There in the 13th chapter of John's gospel, verse 10 and 11. If all of us have that, let us say amen. 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 We'll see there that Jesus, he said to Peter, he's talking to Peter here. He said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but it's completely clean. And you, you are clean, but not all of you, he said there. My, my, that's what Aunt would say if he was here. Then he said there in 11 verse, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. And he said that to Peter, you are not all clean. Amen. Now, from that, those two verses there, I want to focus on, and I want to talk about today for a thought, since we are on the pathway to glory, I want to talk about today for a thought, are you far from God? Again, my thought for today is, are you far from God? Again, 
How can you be on the pathway to glory, but be on the pathway to glory far from the Lord? Now, to see Jesus say that to Peter there in, in my key verses, the fact that he said to Peter, you are not all clean. And he was saying that about the disciples. I don't know about you all, but that kind of hits me. It hits me kind of hard. It hits me in the gut. It makes me, it makes me feel it in my soul. It, it hits me in my emotions. It, it makes me kind of sad. And I don't know if you all, if you all feel that way, but let me explain to you all why seeing Jesus say to Peter that you are not all clean, why it makes me feel so sad. The reason why it makes me feel so sad is because Jesus in saying that he sounds so disappointed. And I don't know if you all picked that up, but he sounds so disappointed to me. The fact that that the, the, the Jesus said of the disciples that you are not all clean. We, we have to remember that Jesus, he chose the disciples for a purpose, that, that he chose the disciples for a reason. Mm -hmm. The reason why he chose the disciples was because they were supposed to be the ones who would be fishers of men, mm -hmm. of the souls of men to be exact. The disciples, they were supposed to closely follow him. They were supposed to follow him down the path that he was going so that they could learn from him, so that they could follow in the example that he was setting, so that they could be able to be the fishers of the souls of mankind. So as we have seen here, when you closely follow Jesus, Jesus, he's not going to lead you down the path to destruction. Jesus, he's going to lead you down the pathway to glory, to holiness, to righteousness. He's going to lead you to his father's house. And as you go down the pathway to glory, Jesus, he's going to walk with you. And as he walks with you, he's going to say, this is how you become holy. This is how you become righteous. He's going to teach you in the way of holiness and righteousness. Jesus, he's going to train you in the way of holiness and righteousness so that you can become holy and righteous so that you can walk with him into the father's house and dwell in the father's house. And Jesus, he does this not out of, of, of selfishness for, for per se. He does this because he loves you. He does this because the will of God is for us to be with him. So he's doing this out of love for the father He's doing this out of love for, for you and for me as well. As we know, Jesus, he said to the disciples that he loved them. He said to the disciples that he desired for them to be just like him. Jesus in the 15th chapter, if you turn over there and look at the 14th verse, you'll see that Jesus said to the disciples, you are my friends. But there was a caveat. He said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So one who says that they are a friend of Jesus, but they aren't doing as Jesus had commanded. I want you to understand today. They can say that they are a friend of Jesus all day long, but if they are not doing, they are not a friend of his. They can say that they love Jesus all day long. But if they're not moving out of love, if they're not doing what he commanded, they don't love him. So, like I said, it's rather sad to see that Jesus said to Peter there that you are not all clean. And he was saying that about the disciples. Again, it's sad because we know the will of God. 
we know that he desires for everyone to have everlasting life, for everyone to be raised up with him at the last day. Jesus, he said that himself. We know that that is the will of God. And so it saddens me to see Jesus disappointed that one of those that he chose was not actually with him. And, and it often makes me wonder about us today. When I say us, I'm talking about mankind. It often makes me wonder how the Lord looks at us. It makes me wonder what the Lord sees when he looks at us. It often makes me wonder what the Lord sees when he looks at those who love to say that they are of faith. It makes me wonder what the Lord sees when he looks at those who love to profess, I'm a Christian. Those who love to say, I love Jesus. Those who love to say, I give honor to God who is the head of my life, but they don't actually move by faith. It makes me wonder if God is disappointed with them. I'm not going to include myself in with that crowd because I am one who is a sincere faith. And it makes me wonder about the professed believer today because there are many today who love to say that they are with God, but in actuality, they're going in the way of Iscariot. Do you want to go down the pathway to glory? Or do you want to go down the pathway of Iscariot today? I certainly hope that you don't want to go down the path of Iscariot. Iscariot, we know, was one of the 12 that was again chosen by Christ. That means something. To be chosen by Christ. That means something. You see, Iscariot, since he was one of the 12, he witnessed the miracles. He was there for the miracles. He heard Jesus teach in public. Not only was he there for the miracles, not only did he hear Jesus's public teachings, but Iscariot, he was present for those private teachings. You know, when the disciples, when they didn't understand something and they would pull Jesus to the side and they would say, Jesus, what, what did you mean by this? And then Jesus would, would sit down with the disciples and, and he would explain what he meant. Iscariot was there. Iscariot, he was even present on the missions when Jesus would send the 12 out. And he would say to the 12 to, to minister and to heal the people. Iscariot, he was there. He was a witness of God in the flesh. Now, the other disciples, when they were in the presence of Christ, they experienced a, a wonderful change in their heart, didn't they? Judas Iscariot was different. He was with Christ. He was with God in the flesh. As John said, they beheld his glory and that glory, it had a change on them, but it did not have a change on Iscariot. One who again said that he loved the Lord, that he loved Jesus. He went up and he kissed Jesus on the cheek, said, Hey friend, how you doing? Before he betrayed him. It truly takes a, a special person to be in the presence of God, but not have a change in their soul. It truly takes a, a special kind of person to, to be with God and not to have a change, a wonderful change. Iscariot, I want you to understand today that he is the example of those who, who love to outwardly profess their love of the Lord, but don't actually have love for God. Do you hear me? Iscariot, he is the, the example of those who outwardly 
profess that they believe in the Lord. Those who say, I'm a Christian. Woohoo, I'm a Christian. But in truth, inwardly, they have the heart of a sinner. That's who Iscariot is the example of. These are those who, again, they love to say one thing, but they do another. These are those who I think the teacher said, these are those who are hypocrites in their hearts. They are hypocrites in their actions. See, these are those that, again, they love to say that they love Jesus, but their actions present a very different nature than one who is actually on the pathway to glory. See, Judas's true heart was, was that of a sinner. It was that of one who's on the broad path. It, was, it is one that was uh, being far away from the Lord. And, and his true heart is actually shown to us on occasion in scripture. If you flip back a chapter to the 12th chapter and you take a look at the fourth through the seventh verse there, you will see that, that Mary had anointed the feet of Jesus. And after she had anointed the feet of Jesus with, with some pricey oils, you'll see that Iscariot had something to say. When we talk about his true heart, Iscariot, he come in at that, hey, those oils, they could have been sold for 300 denarii, he said there. And then, because he, he recognized, he realized that he was the only one that was saying something like that, he tried to, to cover it up. He tried to play off his true heart there by saying, hey, you know, we, 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 could, we could sell it and we could, give, we could give the money to the poor, he said there. Jesus, he shut that down right quick. You see, you see that Jesus essentially had a ah, ah, kind of moment there. Don't want to hear it kind of moment there. And then there in the sixth verse, if you're looking at it, you'll see that John just flat out called Judas a thief when he was talking about him. That was his nature, John said. He was a thief. Why did he call him a thief? John said that he called him a thief there because Judas would steal the money that was in the money box. The disciples, they essentially would put money into the collection plate and the scare was the one that they like to joke about in, in TV shows and in movies that took the collection plate and grabbed money out of it and then walked away with it. That was the kind of heart that the scare it had. He and I asked, what kind of person could say that they're following Christ? What kind of person that, that, that can say that they are, are with Christ, but then they will steal from their own brothers. How can you be on the pathway to glory, rob God, rob your brothers as well? The scary as hard, it never changed as it was only out for itself. He was only out for himself, not for for anybody else, not anything else. He didn't care about anyone else. We know this to be true because in his greatest act, he betrayed Jesus with a kiss for 30 pieces of silver. That's where his heart was. His heart was not with Jesus. If his heart was with Jesus, he would have been on the opposite side. He would have been with the other disciples who was with Jesus in the garden. Hey, they may have fell asleep, but they were actually with Jesus. They were with Jesus in their hearts. He was around Jesus for, for three years, but he didn't change. He didn't learn anything. If you are following Jesus today, you shouldn't be the same person today that you were yesterday. Do you hear me? The sincere believer who's on the pathway to glory should be always changing. We should be changing from that corrupt person, that corrupt sinner. We should be transforming into being a new creation 
a new creature, one that is holy, one that is righteous. If we are following in the way of Christ, our walk should become more upright. Our way should become more just. We shouldn't be crumpled over by the burden, by the weight of sin. I don't know if you hear me here today. Your walk should change. Your talk should change. I don't want to hear anybody tell me it's okay for me to talk this way. And then you go around and you're supposed to be a child of God. I don't want to hear it today. A change must come over you if you are walking down the pathway to glory. If that change has not come over you, if your walk hasn't changed, if your talk hasn't changed, if your thoughts, if they haven't changed, you're doing nothing but making excuses today. It's time for the excuses to stop because you're, you're going down the same path of Iscariot. Judas' story is one of tragedy. His story is one of great disappointment. Do you want your story today to be one of great disappointment? Do you want your story to be uh, today to be one of great tragedy? I hope not. You see, in his tragic story, in, in Judas' story, there is a warning for us. There is actually something that we can learn from Iscariot. Do you believe that? There is a warning, especially for all of those who love to say that they love Jesus, that they are a Christian, that they are a child of God. There's a warning that we must heed today. So somebody may begin to think to themselves, well, what is that warning, Pastor? That warning is something that you heard me say during the Sunday school lesson today. That warning is something that you heard me say in my intro today. That warning is that you can say that you love Christ all day long, but that don't mean that you're going to be in heaven. That warning is that you can say, hey, I, I'm a Christian. You can say all day long, I'm a child of God. You can go to church every Sunday. You can be here for Sunday school. You can be here for the sermons. You can be there for Bible study. You can be there for all of the church events. You can open up the doors of the church. You can serve on the deacon board. You can serve on the usher board. You can be a deacon. You can be a mother in the church. You can be in the choir as well. But that don't mean you're going to be in heaven. You can get baptized. You can take part in communion. That don't mean you're going to be in heaven. I hope you hear me here today. It takes actually walking by faith, moving in in sincere faith. You must make a confession in your heart today, not simply a profession. As Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. His scariest story is one of a pretender. His story is one of a liar. And I ask all of you today, are you pretending faith or are you actually of faith today? That is a question that everybody must answer. That is a question that needs to be answered in the local church today. Are you pretending as my dad would say, are you playing church or are you the church? Are you the believer? See, there are many today who are neglecting the great opportunity that is before them. Like Iscariot, there are many that are neglecting God. They're neglecting what's before them. They are neglecting God's love. They are neglecting his salvation. Warning, warning, warning. You should not neglect the salvation of God. And again, if you have been following my recent Bible studies from the epistle to the Hebrews, then you will know that neglecting salvation 
neglecting the word of God, neglecting his gospel, neglecting Christ. That is the first steps down the path to condemnation. You aren't going down the path to glory if you're neglecting salvation. If you're neglecting God, if you're neglecting his word, if you're neglecting his only begotten son, the promise through his son, if you're neglecting John 316, you're not on the pathway to heaven. You're on the pathway to eternal condemnation. And I want you off of that pathway if you're on that path today. That is why I am preaching this message to you today and for the next few weeks as well. Over in the second chapter of Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, let's turn over there for a moment here today. You see in the second chapter that the writer of the epistle warned about neglecting salvation. The writer in the first verse of the second chapter of Hebrews, you see that the writer advised their people being the Jews to earnestly heed the things that they had heard. And there in that verse, you'll see that the writer warned that if they did not earnestly heed the things that they, that they heard, they would drift away. And what they would drift away from is God's salvation. What they would drift away to is eternal condemnation. You see, there are many today who are on the pathway of condemnation and they're loud. They're loud about it. They're adamant about being on path to condemnation. Whereas there are others who are, who are drifting. They are simply floating into condemnation today. So again, we'll see there in the third verse that the writer asked the question that, that does it, that, that is impossible even for God to answer. The writer said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now the writer is talking about escaping condemnation, eternal condemnation there. The writer is talking about trying to escape eternal condemnation without salvation from Christ. How can you escape eternal condemnation if you're on the pathway to condemnation and don't get off the pathway to condemnation? It's impossible. The only way that you can get off the pathway of condemnation is to take the exit of Jesus. You, you have to recognize the exit signs. You, you can't blow past the warnings, the warnings which come through his word, his instructions. If you keep blowing past the exit signs of Jesus and you continue down that pathway, you continue down the highway of condemnation, you're eventually going to run into the, to the wall of condemnation and you're going to hit it head on. You see, the judgment of neglecting salvation, that is eternal condemnation. And there is no escaping it. It is impossible for you to escape it if you aren't following Christ. Christ is trying to take us away from condemnation. He's trying to take us the opposite direction of condemnation to everlasting life. Again, I don't know about you, but I want to move away from condemnation for everlasting life. Amen. You see, I, I, I want to live forever with the Lord. I, I want to live forever in peace, mm -hmm. in joy. Mm -hmm. And as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today, I want to live in harmony with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Do I need to make that funnel again from last week? You see, I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to live down here forever. That seems like a tough position to live in forever. You know, I, I want to be up there. 
that's where that's where I want to be at today. You see, we, we must not neglect the word of God. History has shown that when you neglect the word of God, the end is not well. Moving away from God, that's not well with him. You see, the, the children of Israel, they, they had a way of escape from condemnation that was given to them through Moses. It was the law. And if they were obedient to the law, Scripture tells us in the, ninth chap the 19th chapter of Exodus and the sixth verse that they would have become a holy nation, a kingdom of, of priests. But they sadly chose the calf of gold over becoming a kingdom of priests. Did, did you hear me? They, they couldn't wait for, for Moses to come out of Mount Sinai before they broke the covenant that they made with the Lord. Here we are living in the world today. Jesus has said to us, watch and wait. Watch and wait. He has given us his law for us to live by. His law Love the Lord with our whole heart. And what else? Love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's all we have to do. Watch and wait. Live by faith. But many of us, we are dancing around a calf of gold today. Did you hear me? Many are dancing around a calf of gold today. Don't you be dancing around that calf of gold that calf of gold is going to lead you to death and to destruction. Now, in their disobedience, God, he still loved Israel and he was sent to them. Even after the calf of gold event, he was sending them prophet after prophet. And prophet after prophet, prophets like Isaiah, prophets like Elijah, Jeremiah, prophet after prophet would cry out to Israel Get off the path of unrighteousness. Get off the path of condemnation. Turn away from it. Take the exercise and get back onto the path to glory. But what did Israel do? They would kill prophets or they would ignore the prophets. Meaning that they would kill God's servants. They would kill the word of God or they would totally disregard the word of God. They would, in other words, neglect God, neglect his word and neglect his salvation. And then after that, when they neglected the prophets, what did God do? He sent his only begotten son who guess what? Shared God's call to repent. You're on the pathway of condemnation. Jesus would say, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, get off of the path of condemnation, turn away from it, take the exit, follow me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. I'm preparing a place for you in my father's house. I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you to myself and I'm going to bring you with me to my father's house. All you have to do is follow me. What did, what did they do? I got a mm -mm on that one. They killed Jesus. They ignored his word. Some, some heeded. Admittedly, some heeded, a few heeded, but again, the word of God was neglected. His only begotten son was neglected. His promise, salvation, was again neglected. Then there were the apostles. God gave his apostles. And several others that, that again ministered. God's call of repentance to this day. God is still calling on repentance. 
Hey, you're going down the pathway of condemnation. I have said today, haven't I? Get off that path. Take the exit. Take Jesus. Follow Jesus. I have said, follow him down the pathway to glory. And what has happened? Well, quite a few of the apostles, they, they were killed. The writer of Hebrews there in the second chapter, in the first verse there, we see that the writer is having to urge the people to be earnest in heeding the gospel. The writer said, stop ignoring God. Here I am today crying out to, to you who are present, to those who may watch and those who may listen. I'm crying out today. Stop ignoring God. But what is the world doing? We are ignoring God. Ignoring God for the calf of gold. Again, we are neglecting God. We are neglecting his word. You aren't neglecting me. You're neglecting his word. You're neglecting his promise. And you're neglecting his salvation. What are you doing? You see, to neglect means to give little attention. To neglect means to give little respect. Why are you giving God so little of attention today? Why do you not honor? Why do you not respect God who has given us life in this world? Who continues to bless us day by day? Who, who lifts us up over all of our struggles, who brings us through all of our trials and, and our tribulations, who lets us and helps us be able to persevere in all of our infirmities so that we can overcome all of our afflictions. And yet, Many don't recognize the Lord. Many don't honor him. Many don't even respect him. Many say that they love him, but they don't love him. What are we doing today? Now begin to wonder why do so many people neglect God? Many, they neglect God because they think they truly believe that they're going down the right path. There are many today that feel they have no need of God. They don't pray to God. They are in fellowship with God. They don't have part with him because they truly believe that they're on the right path. But again, we saw in the 14th chapter of Proverbs last week in the 12th verse, the 12th verse there, that there is a way that seems right to a man but it is a way that leads to death. It leads to destruction. So if you're thinking that way today, I tell you that it is time for you to turn around. It frightens me today that so many people are taking the pathway of Iscariot. When God's word has been made known, it is present with us today. And many people haven't had a change in their heart. That frightens me. So the, the writer of Hebrews had essentially asked, how do we escape condemnation? In order for us to escape condemnation, one must choose the right path. That path is to follow Christ. Now, on this pathway of following Christ, Jesus told Peter that to have part with him, he said that he needed to wash him. He said, if I do not wash you, he said, you have no part with me, is what Jesus said there. And then there in the 10th verse, there in my key verse, Jesus said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. Now, what did, what did, what did Jesus mean by this? What did he mean by, by what he said there to Peter when he said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet? Now, let us turn over to the third chapter of John's gospel here for a moment. When we look in the third chapter of John's gospel, we see Jesus speaking with Nicodemus. There in the third verse, 
Jesus, he said to Nicodemus something that we have heard before. I referenced the scripture a lot. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Emphasis there on born again. If you don't have that highlighted in your Bible yet, you need to highlight it. You need to draw attention to that. One must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Now, now when Nicodemus heard that, he asked Jesus, what, what do you mean by, by being born again? And we'll see that, that Jesus, he explained to him there in the fifth verse that unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, unless one is born of water and the spirit. You know, there are a couple of things for us to take note there from what Jesus said to Nicodemus. First and foremost, Jesus, I want you to understand that he was talking about spiritual cleansing. He wasn't talking about physically taking a bath. He said water and the spirit. He's talking about spiritual cleansing there. And John, he wrote that, that in order for one to walk in the light, he said the blood of Jesus must cleanse all sins. John, he said in his epistle that he said that if one says that they are in fellowship with Christ, again, he said, if they say they're in fellowship with Christ, but walk in darkness, I hope you hear that. John said that they lie and that they do not practice the truth. Again, like I said, they're hypocrites. So when we take a look at Jesus there speaking to Peter, about washing the disciples, washing their feet there, we actually see an illustration of spiritual cleansing, if you follow me here. Again, when we take a look there at the 10th verse, let us notice that Jesus said to Peter there again, he said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. I put emphasis on the bathed there because that's past tense. That means that someone, they've already gotten their bath. They've already taken their bath, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now during that day, when, when people would take a bath, they would have to go to the public bathing pool or they would have to go to a public fountain in order for them to take a bath. Mm -hmm. When they were done with their bath, they would have to go back home. And at that point in time, they weren't walking around on cement. They were walking around in dirt and in sand. So if you think about it, they, they had washed themselves. They had taken their bath. They were clean when they were in the water from head to toe. But they had to take a trip back home. And when they took that trip back home, their feet would get back dirty. And so they would need to wash their feet. And so when they got back home, they would take one of those watering pots that Jesus used in his miracle of, of turning water to wine. They would take their watering pots and they would water off their feet so that they could be clean from head to toe again. So what Jesus was saying to Peter there was that Peter's soul had already been washed. He was already clean from, from, from head to toe. He was clean from head to toe because he had already confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of God. His confession, it, it, it washed him. He was washed by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Now, Peter, even though he, he had his soul washed by the shed blood of Jesus, he still had to live in this world. He still had to take the journey mm -hmm. towards the kingdom of heaven. He still had to go down the pathway, that narrow path that I said we are surrounded by sin. So he could fall into temptation. He could fall into sin again. And so Jesus was saying, you have to have your feet washed. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be in fellowship with me, if you're going to have part with me on this journey to the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Do you see what that means for all of us today? Mm -hmm. Even though you have joined the church even though you have said that you believe, you have to make that confession. Mm -hmm. 
even if you make the confession in your heart, you are still more than able to fall into temptation. In other words, you're still able to get your feet dirty on this spiritual journey. And so if you want to have part in Christ, if you want to be in fellowship with him on the pathway to glory, you have to acknowledge my feet still get it dirty, Jesus. You see, Iscariot, he never recognized that he wasn't even bathed. You know, we often sing about that fountain filled with blood, right? Iscariot, he never dipped himself into that fountain. So not only was his feet dirty, but he was a filthy mess from head to toe. Now, all of us who have confessed in our hearts, Jesus, he shed his blood for us, but we still can have smelly feet. Y'all following my figurative speech here? Our feet can still get dirty, meaning that we ain't perfect. Nobody is perfect. Y'all done heard me say that a million times. I ain't perfect, and I ain't trying to fool nobody. My feet can get as dirty as anybody else's feet. But what separates the sincere believer from the professed believer is that we will acknowledge that our feet still get messy. And we, like Peter did, we will make our confession known to Christ. And as John said in his first epistle, in the first chapter and the ninth verse, the Lord is both faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, if you desire to go down that pathway to the kingdom of heaven, you have to acknowledge this today. You have to be washed. You have to be bathed from head to toe. And you only have to go to that fountain one time. Jesus shed his blood only one time for us. But when you're on this path, you have to come to Christ. And you have to say, Christ, my feet are dirty. I need to have my feet washed so that I can continue to walk with you. So many are far from God today because they are unable to get past their own ego, their own pride. They truly believe that they are perfect. That is their self-righteousness talking. And if you want to walk with Jesus, you have to put your self-righteousness, you have to put it to the side. You see, I feel the reason why so many neglect God, they neglect his word, they neglect his only begotten son, they neglect the premise of salvation. I feel that so many do it today because of their pride and their ego. They can't get past themselves. You see, many, they neglect God because they are ignorant of the condition of their soul. They don't think it's a mess. Many, out of their ignorance, they don't, they don't think that their soul is a mess because, again, they think that they're actually going in the right way. And because they believe that their way is the right way, these are those that Paul he said that they are ignorant of God's righteousness as they seek their own righteousness. This is the way of calamity. This is the way to condemnation. If that is you, get out of that way. Take the exit. Others, they neglect the path to glory because they can't see. They say, I can't see anything. I can't see God. I can't see. And so because they are unable to see the spiritual realm and its effects, its consequences, again, many, they choose to live in ignorance rather than to look for it. And I tell you today that there is a great danger in ignoring what you cannot see. There is a great danger when you are ignoring the exit signs on the pathway of condemnation. In Hebrews, the, the second chapter, the second verse, the writer, 
again, referenced how guys were proved to be steadfast in the past, how every transgression was witnessed to receive a just reward. I think about how Abraham was there to witness the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think about how, how Noah, how he was there to witness the great flood. Several witnessed how the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians. Several witnessed how the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians. The work of God, it is witnessed. The work of God is present today. If you cannot see the consequence of sin, I tell you, just open up your front door. Look at our world today. This world is a mess. It's filthy. It is shrouded by, it is covered in sin. But the will of God is that everyone be saved from this world. The will of God is that everyone get off the path of condemnation to believe in the only begotten son and to follow him. And so again, I ask you today, will you follow Jesus? Will you truly follow him? My message for all of those who love to profess that they follow Christ, that they believe in him. My message to you today is stop professing faith and actually be about faith. And if you are already of sincere faith, my message to you today is don't worry about this. Just continue to move in sincere faith. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this sermon and that you'll be able to apply what you have watched, that you have heard, that you have listened to, apply it to yourself and then share it with somebody somewhere. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following the Newfound Faith channel. Be sure that you're following today so that you don't miss a sermon, so that you don't miss a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study or a food for thought. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you share the Newfound Faith channel with someone somewhere.